Hello, Anju. Anju, good afternoon. Yes, yes, I am here. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Good, good. I'm also doing good. It's a bit cold in uh, Delhi. Yeah. yeah. There the weather must be pleasant, right? Yes, yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Enjoy the weather. Enjoy Christmas. Yes. Fine. Can you, can you hear me? Sorry? पहले दिन तो मैंने दिया था मुझे सेकंड डे का नहीं पता क्या क्या बोलना हां जाओ पीछे लो ये कंट्री चिकन मिल रहा है छह सौ रुपए के जी बापरे गुड आफ्टरनून बता रहा सर गुड आफ्टरनून सर Good afternoon, hi there. Okay, sir. Brother, sir, you are not audible. I am not audible now. Hello. Hello. Am I on? Good afternoon, sir.
Hello. Hi yes, there. Am I afternoon. audible now? Now you are audible, sir. Okay, fine, fine. I'll join in five minutes. Yeah. Okay. I'll sir. come back. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, Rajiv sir. Good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Ali sir, can we uh, start the session, please? Ali sir. Yes, Shipra, I think we can start now. Okay, sir. So, a uh, very good afternoon to all the respected dignitaries, esteemed panelists, participants. On behalf of NIDM, I extend you all a very warm welcome to this second day of training program on community-based disaster risk reduction and management, jointly organized by NIDM and Mahatma Gandhi University, Kerala. 
Firstly, I would like to welcome Shri Hari Krishna C. Rag for a brief recap of the first day. So over to you, sir. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, yesterday we have, hello, uh, good afternoon. Yesterday we have two sessions. First session is uh, inaugural session. And uh, second session uh, was about uh, the uh, main presentation. Uh, yesterday we have two presentation. One is about uh, disaster and disaster management. And another is about community-based disaster risk reduction and community engagement. And the first session was carried out by Susan Suganya. The presentation was... Hello. Hello. I request you all to please mute yourself so we can hear the speaker. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Okay. How the disaster management is carried out in international level and as well as national level. And it also mentioned about the definitions and uh, uh, and the presentation is the uh, point out the presentation, uh, presentation presentator point out the connection between disaster management and uh, sustainable development. And there are a few key important areas which uh, was uh, briefly mentioned. Uh, the comparison between natural disaster and man-made disaster and it was uh, presented as a graphical uh, uh, representation and the disaster management structure and how the disaster management uh, policy is implemented and uh, the importance of the Ministry of Home Affairs. And this, uh, another one is calls of dis uh, disaster management and uh, uh, impact of disasters uh, and how it going to impact in economic and social and cultural level and its long-term and short-term uh, impact. And uh, the key, uh, uh, concept uh, which you have mentioned in the present uh, presentation is the Sendai framework and the last and most importantly the 10 points of the Prime Minister's agenda for the disaster risk reduction and the second presenter, presenter Ali Haidar uh, he presented his topic uh, is, as com uh, community based disaster risk reduction and community engagement uh, 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 two major questions uh, was uh, 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 was analyzed. First one is how community can help the reduct, uh, re uh, help to reduce the risk of any disaster, whether it is man-made or uh, human na nature-made. And the second question is how we can, I mean, the a community can engage into the risk reduction process. The he also mentioned about the basic themes like community capacity, capacity building, disaster risk reduction, and most importantly, early warning system to uh, reduce the risk of disaster disasters and uh, resilience and vulnerability and uh, and uh, the community is the first and the uh, uh, community is the first to respond to the disaster uh, to train and prepare them is the key to uh, measure the survivability of the disaster and uh, it also mentioned the dis uh, different stages of community based disaster risk reduction and objective process of uh, community-based uh, disaster risk reduction and the roadmap to CBDRR, uh, the ro especially the role of uh, Grama Panjait and uh, decentralization, uh, the role of institutions, uh, Panjait Raj and uh, Grama Sabha, etc. And uh, most importantly, he's uh, uh, he mentioned about the capacity building of the community and the post and the pre-disaster phases. And uh, and finally, as I, uh, in the conclu uh, conclusion part, he mentioned a uh, few uh, important uh, the operations which was carried out by the community and how the community engagement reduced the human casualty as well as the uh, total destruction caused by the uh, disaster. And that's all for uh, for uh, in the recap session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, moving forward, I would like to take this auspicious opportunity to welcome uh, Shrimati Rekha J, Rekha J uh, for a uh, welcome address. So, uh, welcome you, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. A very warm good afternoon to an unknown presented here on behalf of School of International Relations and Politics. I'm pleased to welcome today's key speakers, Dr. Subhasis Badra, Associate Professor, Department of Social Work, Central University of Rajasthan. Mr. Vivek C.K., C, uh, Senior Global Humanitarian Manager, 
Asia and Middle East, Kristen Abe, and Dr. Rajiv M. Mam, Assistant Professor, Department of Social Work, Central University of Rajasthan, to this three-day online training program on community-based disaster risk reduction and management. I further welcome the moderator, Ms. Shipra Das, Young Professional, National Institute of Disaster Management. And last but not the least, I would also like to welcome each and every participants to this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, now it's time for our technical session. And uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Shubhashish Badra, uh, Associate Professor, Department of Social Work, Central University of Rajasthan. And he holds a master's degree in social work and MPhil and PhD in uh, physiatric uh, social work and uh, NIM AHS Bangalore. He is actively engaged in the disaster management intervention programs in India and across Asian countries and started his teaching career in 2010. In his credit, there is a number of academic articles and book chapters two books published by uh, nationally and internationally reputed publishers. Uh, we welcome you, sir, and we are honored to have you. Thank you so much. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for organizing this. Especially, I thank uh, NIDM and Mahatma Gandhi uh, Vishavidyalai Keral for taking up this uh, very important and significant event. Uh, in fact, when we talk like uh, from last 20 years, specifically I am engaged in the aspect of disaster management. And we see that uh, this is something which is uh, really bothering. And uh, even in pandemic, what happens in this biological disaster is that mental health, psychosocial problem, become the second wave of the pandemic because each and every situation of the disaster has a major impact on the mind and we really get to go through that answers whether we have something to do with it and how do we rebuild the mind how do we rebuild the community's resiliency that they can be in a position to deal with the problems of the present and have an outcome to think about future. So it doesn't happen on its own. So we need to have, we, we are trying to answer, like I just framed these questions and I hope that we will have some answers following the my talk and following the discussion with all of you with your inputs to see that how best we could do. And Kerala, is facing the COVID, which is a kind of concern. It has faced the flood and many other situations. A bit of tsunami impact was also there. So taking all that, India is also is called as theater of disaster. None of us is free from it, or India is not immune to any disaster. So wherever we are, disaster events are occurring and they're more like now part of our everyday life. So we need to be resilient. And we know it is impacting our mental health. So we also need to understand what is disaster from psychosocial perspective or mental health condition. What actually it is really disaster cause an issue on mental health. What is community resiliency? Can we build up resiliency? And what do we do at the end? These are some important things let us look into. I'm very sure you have already understood or gone through a lot of definitions of disasters. But when you talk about mental health and psychosocial situation, this is a very important definition, which says this is a disruption of the ecological and psychosocial balance. So that means the disaster cause an impact on the mental health on the psychosocial issues, where people feel disturbed, unable to sleep, unable to eat, started fighting, not knowing how to build the future. Even you know, when you were working in tsunami, the people have got boats in its house, but do not want to go for fishing. Once they go, they come back and do not want to go for four, five days. If they're asked, why are you not going? The person says, why should I go? What is the need of money? When I am back on the seashore, 
I see many kids are playing. My kid is not there. So I don't feel like going. Though he has got everything, he has got house, he has got both nets, but his mind is not bad. Somebody becomes super <coughs> religious, somebody becomes superstitious, somebody becomes angry, somebody becomes lazy. And overcoming this, when people come back, then they start reworking to develop a better conditions of living. So wherever we are, the purpose is to go ahead and build a better condition of living. So disaster greatly exceeds that coping capacity of the community. People can't handle themselves. So they require external support to rebuild the life. So external support become very, very important. There are a lot of different dimensions to see. But we need to understand that a disaster is really a disaster as of now when it is causing the human impact. Like climate change is happening, we did not bother till the time it is impacting our life. Or virus, we don't bother if it doesn't get into our life. Or a kind of lack of rain in a desert where nobody leaves, you don't call it a disaster. Or a landslide in a hill where nobody leaves, it is not a disaster as such. So one aspect of disaster, when you look at the social perspective, that it impacts the human life. So impact on the human life is the major aspect to consider an event and disaster and we start bothering. So climate change is now really impacting us. So we are bothering, but we are happening from long ago. 1970 reports have said by 2030, world will have severe crisis. Did we bother at 1970? No because it didn't cause that much problem. So we also need to understand as we are developing, progressing, we are increasing our vulnerability gradually. Like once upon a time, if we give an example, we're going by Bullock cart. There was accident in Bullock cart also, but it used to move very slow, maybe 10, 12 kilometers per hour. We are going by a supersonic jet. If there is a disaster, chance of survival is less. But if there is a disaster, there is an accident of the bullock cart, the chance of survival is very high. The same way, when you have a school in a single story to two story building, or you live in a two story or a single story building, the incident of fire and escaping become much easier than we'll live in a multi story building. So, multi story building, high speed train flight, everything is sign of our development, equally increasing the amount of risk, vulnerability. So with climate change, we are facing a lot of vulnerability. With that two important aspects, human aspect is human aggression. All this war, refugee, border conflict, people are attacking. So if you see that, we don't talk about creating a peaceful border. Whatever the country, India, China, India, Pakistan, no. We want to show our power. We want to show you have more military capacity because that is the way overall we are facing the human crisis is happening because of human aggression. As a whole, the world population is not growing as a human population. It is all growing with a divided kind of attitude. Dividers are set in in every condition. So this divider in national disaster, national dividers in terms of all the borders. Inside, if you see caste-based dividers, so there's so many dividers in our society. That is the human aggression. Then human consumption. We consume everything. Now we are more consumerist. We are doing more consumerism. We are living in an era. So more consumption is also increasing a lot of problems. So what is happening, if you look at the scientific development, like things are becoming improved, but they're lasting for less. Like earlier when mobile used to go, that Nokia or the Motorola with a, with a kind of thing on its head, a horn, that used to work for five, six hours. But now this good mobiles with so many functions don't last more than two years. If you are very careful, it might increase more. And it is said like this is only its lifetime. 
showing the development what we are creating. We are reducing its lifespan. We are consuming more, whether it is our electronic goods, whether it is food, everything. We need to see that how this consumerism has actually has created a lot of unequal distribution and increasing the threats of disasters. And we need to also understand that surviving or the disaster survivors have a right to survive. So what we do, it's not just good to do because we need to understand all these people have paid their tax while they were earning, while they buy something. So a state, a nation have a responsibility to work for its disaster survivor. So it is a very important human rights perspective. So government is responsible. On an average, disaster leads to disruption, deaths, uh, imbalance, and disturbance in the social situation. So as a whole, what happens, what we see is that it caused a lot of detachment. So it's caused a lot of displacements. And the sense of place is missing. The sense of place means where we live. We develop a sense of place, that how I'm living in a place, like a child, no, this is my house, this is my bed, this is the way to go to school. Here is my playground where I go out and play and that's my uncle, that's my auntie, that's my parents, that's my neighboring bhaiya. So they know. So all this creates an attachment. When disaster happens, suddenly the playground is full of garbage, house is no more because of flood, because of tsunami, because of earthquake, whatever it is. Should they suddenly see the known situation become unknown. So there is lot of problem, loss of attachment. The familiar situation become unfamiliar and there is lot of crisis in the identity. Why we need to talk about resilience? Identity means like somebody is known by his profession. Like somebody is a driver, now he doesn't have his hand, he can't drive anymore. Or somebody is known as mother of a child. Now the child is not there. Or somebody become widow or we do or gets a new added identity to it. So as a whole, we see the disaster cause a lot of problem in terms of this changing, which impacts the psychological conditions, the psychosocial issues. So disaster is not just the only problem. It is being said that the disasters and the real disasters in the life of the marginalized poor people in the nations which are poor, which are, lack, which are lacking in their people. So disaster is a real disaster. If a developed country face disaster, the chance of recovery or their recovery time is much less because the social support, the investment is much higher. But a country like India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, we take a lot of time. Even in Bhuj, if you see people live years together on the temporary shelter. Even if we go in the Uttarakhand, we see that same issues are still going on. So there are a lot of pre-existing vulnerabilities, like unemployment, discriminations, with all these. When disasters happen, then there is added mental health disorder, gender discrimination. So pre-existing problems become highly exposed or they increase in the disaster situation. Then there is a lot of emergency-induced problem. If we do not tackle it well, so there is emergency indu induced problem. Like there is family conflict, disruption, all these are there. But because of the disaster, then what happens is that there is depression, anxiety, disorder, all these kind of mental health issues gets added. So disaster increasing the mental health problem. So if it is being said, like all the people, everybody who witnessed disaster is affected by disaster. Over the time, as they receive the support, they are in a position to recover. If the support delay, the events, the, it is not the event of the disaster, the subsequent event, how much time it is taking to get the support? Is the lady getting abused while she is trying to collect food for a child? Then disaster is not only the event that causes problem, rather the subsequent events become the major problem which are causing a lot of social and psychological problems. And that is also a humanitarian-induced problem. 
That means if we do not understand the social structure, if we don't understand what is the community's well-being, how the community is doing traditionally managing their life, then what happens is that disaster-induced problem increases. Like in South India, the slacks were provided as the clothes or the jeans, but the people are comfortable in wearing, wearing the culturally appropriate sari and dhoti or lungi. If that is not given, then it doesn't make sense. In Bhuj, we have seen there were a lot of tuna feces were distributed. It doesn't work. So these are all human induced at the disaster humanitarian problem one. Once the humanitarian aid is not appropriately designed, humanitarian response is not understood or designed without understanding the culture, the perspective, the social situation problem goes higher. So there are multiple impact, physical, social, economic impact. There are different vulnerable group. I'm not going to talk. Anybody needs, I'll send it. You can share it with everybody. So there are different kinds of vulnerable people who have issues, who require special support. So any disaster situation, we need to have a vulnerability mapping to reach out. But if we say from the mental health perspective, everybody is affected. Now we need to work for everyone in the community and facilitate the adequate recovery process by mobilizing support, by training people, by giving them understanding. Over a period of one year or two years, if supports are adequately provided, it is being seen that 80 to 85% to 90% gets recovered well, who are back to normalcy, if they are provided with adequate psychosocial support. Psychosocial support means that opportunities to talk, the connectedness, the ability to share, get appropriate information, and able to seek the support. So all these things facilitates the resiliency building that the people become more resilient. So there are many definitions of psychosocial. So some important aspect that this has two important psychological and social dimension. Psychological means it is internal emotions, thought process, feelings, and reactions. So whatever the incident we are going through, there is an internal conditions. There is an emotions, there is thought process. If there is a severe loss of the livelihood or house or loss, self-injury or loss of family members, there are issues like that. So there is an internal emotions, thought process, feelings, which we need to heal. And there is social conditions like relationships, family, community, network, social values, cultural practice, which are destroyed often, which are eroded often, which are weakened. We need to rebuild and strengthen back better. So what is essential that the psychosocial support refers to the action that address both psychological and social issues. And this psychosocial condition, the psychosocial work, is most important for resilience. So resiliency building happens through psychosocial support. Like there is many guidelines. So it's a process of facilitating resilience. What the psychosocial support framework have said, it's a process of facilitating resilience within individual, families, community. So what does it mean resilience? It's ability to bounce back. It's ability to bounce back from the impact of disaster and build capacity to deal with such an event in future. So ability to bounce back, like if I tell you something like this, if it is a physical, then I do a lot of exercise to explain. Like this is one paper. It won't stand like this. If you try to, by hold it, if I'm trying to make it straight, straight grand, it doesn't stand because it is resilient. Now we do some interventions, like I am folding. So once I, hold these papers, then what happens? See, it is standing. I'm holding it, it's standing. I'm just doing it, it is coming back to its earlier situation. So what happens to it? It's become resilient. So resilience is not an automatic outcome. We have to do something. And that something is what? That is the psychosocial support, which is an umbrella term where mental health component is the lead thing. So every work we do, whether we build a house, whether we want to do the livelihood practice, the important thing is that we have to ensure that 
there is a mental health psychosocial support in addition to it. Otherwise, we construct the house. We don't make it home. People don't want to live inside. So we need to talk to them. We need to help them out from the trauma and take understanding of the current situation, develop the acceptance of the future. So psychosocial care foster resilience in survivors and the community and serve to prevent the psychological or pathological, pathological psychological development, pathological development. Pathological development means where it's become very difficult to handle. That's become a pathology. People become severely upset. People start fighting. There is a lot of community conflict emerge. So all this happens. So resilient community is what? Resiliency building is an empowering process. So when you do the psychosocial support, we encourage them to come up and do something together. Like when, when uh, Gujarat earthquake did happen or Gujarat riot happened. Now the people doesn't meet each other. Everybody feels that's a border, that's a border. I should not go there, I should not do that. Or after the earthquake, if the 15th August they feel another earthquake will come. People doesn't feel like sleeping inside. Children doesn't want to come to the schools because they feel that another earthquake will kill them. And the children said, I do not want to go to the school because another earthquake come, I'll die somewhere. My parents will die somewhere. I don't want to live that. So this is not just one case. This is many, many more. So we need to understand there is an adverse situations like disaster and ability to adopt. So resiliency means there is an adverse situation happens. And then again, we rebuild them that they could adopt to those situations. And further quality of adoption to the adversity. How, how, how good quality? They're just adversing, adjusting because there is no other option or they are adopting, getting adjusted because they feel this is the best. This is, I could contribute. This helps me to see the future, understood? So that way, the quality of adoption, once we take the psychosocial support in the core, then it helps in better quality of adoption. So resilience is the capacity to transfer oneself positively. Community resilience is about abilities to deal with, resp with uh, responsibility and mitigate, prevent, and all those conditions where the community is better prepared. Show the resilient community, recover faster, respond adequately, take care of each other better. So resiliency is a positive trajectory of function. And resilient community maintain better well-being and also have sustainable pattern of if we are really able to do it, it makes a sustainable part. So they develop the community committees who are responsible to organize the youths. So anything happened, this group of youths can go. Or they know that this is the place, this is the food stock we have. So once they get the warning, they start making the community aware that you come this place, this is a safe place. You bring your basic survival kit. So they are prepared. So that is essential. That is the resilient community, which helps to build up. So to build that resiliency, it is the process of psychosocial support often you choose. So who can give it? It is the community volunteer, it is the teachers, it is the SAG member, traditional leader, community leader, leader program staff, government staff, health worker, uh, a name or ASA worker, everybody need to be trained. So when to work? on resiliency before the disaster, during the disaster, after the disasters. So before the disaster, we build better. So as part school or college activity, any project, any developmental program, everywhere we need to have the component that where the resiliency could be built out. So we build as an integrated manner or we may do it as a standalone program also, but an integrated program is so it is important aspect for recovery. So how it is rebuilding the social support system, normalizing the routine, facilitate emotional first aid, programming at all level are essential. So rebuilding social support system, encourage the community volunteer to participate in disaster response or in disaster response program or disaster preparedness program. Involve the community, involve the social support mechanism and effectiveness. 
like if you see so the individual the individual initiatives are very much essential so you go in the community and we understand we facilitate the individual we create the youth leaders for the purpose we create the sag women we train the icds workers so that is the individual initiative by doing that we create a better resilient group of youths better resilient families so as a whole community become resilient so we need to see that how best we could develop this layer of support system like very common example if we take when in a normal situation if somebody of the village or islam or in urban area dies then what happens then the family comes relatives comes help that individual helps that family to overcome they do all the rituals of bringing the body or taking care and then 15 day rituals and then they try to see whatever the insurance he had so like that mm -hmm. the other support systems comes but when there is a disaster what happens in a village everybody is affected so nobody is in a position to help each other the relatives are also affected nobody is able to reach there so the individual capacity is at danger the group bonding is eroded the community is unable to support each other so we need to rebuild as well as before disaster we make them aware by designing the program like this where we train them we allow them to think and we facilitate the normalization so normalization why normalization because feeling sad is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation so after a disaster feeling depressed feeling sad or after losing somebody feeling disturbed is normal reaction so after the disaster everybody is affected i say so that is called a normal reaction to an abnormal situation why it is a normal reaction because the situation is abnormal let me give you an example like when you walk on the road there are street dogs do you run looking at the street dogs no you don't run but if the street dog is mad and trying to bite you running at you what will you do you will run run fast to save your life so running at the time is normal because the situation is abnormal the same is in the disaster in disaster situation people feel sad feel disturbed because it is a normal reaction now we need to normalize the condition normalize the reaction by adopting by developing the process of adapt adaptation for them so we facilitated the how the family could reunite themselves start cooking start sharing their problem what are the medical care provide the psychological first aid how to start the community kitchen so if we are better prepared for the disaster once we get the warning or once we feel there is a threat we are in a position to manage them better and after a disaster reopening the schools are very essential so psychosocial support as such or psychological first aid has certain very basic things like we allow people to ventilate when something happens it's like example of a pressure cooker if a pressure cooker does not make city it will blast because it is on a fire so disaster situation is like that everybody is on fire if we do not allow them to talk they will start shouting they will feel like the condition is going out of hand out of mind so listening is important being empathetic understanding their conditions supporting accordingly externalization of interest is very essential like somebody is a good cook can this be do it can they be joined in the community kitchen youths can be engaged to do the immediate survey the old age people can be made them to sit together with the kids so there are different way we need to see that how do we externalize this task how do we externalize somebody is uh, mic is on okay so that way we need to see and rebuild the social support system relaxation spirituality is very very important 
also spiritual well being and mental health and disaster situations are very closely connected spirituality doesn't mean religiosity spirituality means it is the feeling of being human being grateful to the super power able to connect to oneself because after the disaster there is lot of damage to the spiritual well being somebody feels i did puja every day what is the benefit of it i did namaz every day five times namaz what is the outcome i did pray every time my charge is also gone what is the use should this kind of questions keep coming up so at the time it is also essential to rebuild the spiritual self but even after that what is left for us even after that can we live even after that what god wants you to do for that reason you don't need a priest you don't need anybody you need to evolve that how people can join together and start rebuilding their spiritual belief system by doing a bhajan kirtan by reading together by offering so these are all the community process of rebuild the same way psychological first aid is not very not very different than what i said the other way we also said international psychological first aid ends your safety comfort provide them adequate care meeting with the physical needs so all these are connected so psychosocial support is very important for dealing with mental health and resilience building so understand the change decrease the physical emotional reaction help to support and rebuild life that is important so help to share like in the first box if you see in the first box if you see that it says that how do we understand the change so working on it through the psychosocial support system that means we are doing the psychological first aid we are listening to them we are being empathetic we are helping them to express and by doing that the physical reactions like there are a lot of aches pain inability to do and unable to adjust with the change situation these are all very variations here and help to rebuild the life like these are the other associated services that is needed like housing compensation paralegal aid should these all work in combination if we miss the first two and only we feel the last one will help doesn't help the outcome is much less i said like when mental health is not there people goes got everything but do not want to leave do not want to go for life before. so psychosocial support is something like a salt the food which requires salt if you do not add there is a huge difference in the test but it is not costly it is the most probably the most cheapest ingredient in that vegetable but if you don't add the taste is very different the same is applicable for psychosocial show that they are doing housing you need to sit with them talk to them so the housing volunteers can go like if i tell you uh, in gujarat art there are a lot of physically handicapped paraplegic people now the physical therapist that is the physiotherapist goes everybody action aid hi handicapped international my organization oxfam india many other local organization appointed lot of physical a uh, therapist physiotherapist to go and help this uh, spinal cord injured people but the spinal cord injured people start questioning should i be able to walk if i cannot walk why should i practice this why are you pulling me i don't want they start shouting looking at this physical therapist their family members tells what have you studied if by your treatment my son my daughter can't walk don't come so the physiotherapist was very disturbed what is happening then i was given the task i tell them see first you have to build their hope ask them have you had your food are you able to sleep did you feel that what is your expectation how much should do that establish your rapport then you do so i trained all of them that was one of my major task which i have written that is the mental health so they become empowered to understand that they are not just patient they are individual they have to first accept that they have a problem they have a life even after that once the physiotherapist were changed many of them came and told yes dr bhadra what you said that works when we are starting now people wants to see they are not shouting 
Now they are telling, yes, we can live even better. So that is important. That whatever you are doing, when you are doing a housing, train the volunteers to train what is house. Because everybody will try to have, I need a five room house. But you have to, by doing that, you help them to understand the reality and facilitate the kind of support what you do. So psychosocial support is develop the habit of exercise, active living, be with family, friends, take good sleep, take what, try to be physically activity, active, talk, share, do some yoga, have spiritual shape, write down your experience. So all these essential at the individual level, at the family, be like a family, have a circle of support, encourage to talk, facilitate gender role, and try some out of uh, having a fun together. So all these are important. At the community level, developing the volunteer, connecting with Nehru Juba Kendra, youth group, developing this PSP influencer who could really talk, who has the ability to integrate, to develop that support group, even in the COVID situation, developing this practice of awareness is very, very crucial. So to facilitate that support. Even in COVID situation, I say that now we need to create the digital volunteers like somebody is unable to go into the COVID, somebody is unable to apply a card by using the online mechanism. So we also need to create this, physical, this uh, kind of digital volunteer as part of our program. So this is a kind of intervention model which we had, I have said, interact with the community, develop community, support, follow up, then do home visit, do group discussion, develop the responsible community committee, organize through community mapping, do community mobilization, show plan, design, develop information, and create a sense of place project. So planning, designing, community participation, coordination with local authorities, and finally, community develop the ownership of their program. Is that process of developing community resilience? So you develop the community com committee by bringing the responsible people, you to even SA, GPRI, so all that together. Some photographs of Tamil Nadu is here. You do a lot of mobilization activities of bringing them together. They can share, they can talk, they can have the 15th August together. They can celebrate an Oman version that everybody comes together. They can do their cultural specific rituals like in Tamil Nadu. Uh, cooking pangal in Gujarat, it is dance in Uttarakhand. It is something like uh, coming together and doing a bhajan together for some God. So everywhere you have some cultural component which help to rebuild. Equality rallies are essential, some community events. So putting them kol kolam, which is common in South India. So you are bringing them to rebuild, rethink, organize some activities like sports day, 15th August, 8th. So 8 uh, March, all these events are very, very essential to bring the people together, to reorganize the community, set up together, build the individual to come and walk, give their voluntary time and look for the future. Psychological activities are equally essential to build the situation better. And then like cleanup campaign, community, community, small projects, like these are to rebuild the sense of place. Like if they had a children park, that can be rebuilt. If they want to build a community center of swings, teaching, that can be done. So all these are different ways to build the community through the psychosocial support. So there are many guidelines. I will not talk. If you are interested, you can look. In these guidelines, these things are all being explained. I have just put that there is a government guideline too, which has come in 2009, which talks about preparedness, response, and implement in this way. So we focus on build back better and mental health will the situation of trauma create a post-traumatic growth. So they become sustainable, they develop a better capacity to deal with. So in every disaster situation, we have to use to have a post-traumatic growth through the approach of build back better. So we need to listen, understand our physical reaction, we help them, others also, to have a healthy lifestyle. That will help us to deal with the problem. So I'll stop here. I have gone two minutes more. Okay, thank you. So any question, any clarification now or at the end, I could take it up.
Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I must say that it was a very wonderful session you have taken and uh, the participants are also requesting for the PPT as they are much interested in the publications. So I would request you to please share it with us. So, and uh, you started the session by answering few basic questions and correlating the disaster and psychosocial perspective. And also you explain the disaster dimensions, basically ex explaining until a disaster bothers, we don't know the vulnerability of it. So um, a detailed meaning of psychosocial perspective was also um, uh, presented by you. Thank you so much. And uh, that was a really wonderful session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. And uh, next I request uh, Shri v Vivek CK, Senior Global Humanitarian Manager, Asia and Middle East uh, Christian Aid. Uh, he has been the uh, response program manager at Save the Child International uh, at Fiji. Also an emergency preparedness specialist at the uh, Plan International. He has also managed many international projects. I welcome you, sir, uh, to speak. Thank you. Uh, can you can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. All right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, training program. I'm so happy that uh, SARP is taking this initiative with the support of uh, NIDM uh, on such an important topic these days because we know that uh, disaster and management has become a hot topic now, and especially in Kerala. Last uh, couple of years, we had uh, uh, severe flooding, and that has uh, actually improved the awareness of people about disasters and the different consequences. And uh, hence, after uh, I've been We've been seeing a lot of uh, training programs and uh, awareness building programs all on disasters and disaster preparedness in Kerala. And on that uh, stream of thought, and as I say, uh, has taken initiative to discuss an idea I and mean, uh, get this important training on. Um, I mean, I'm happy. I'm also proud that I'm, I'm part of SARP uh, in, uh, doing my PhD there. And uh, thank you very much, you know, sir, for uh, organizing this and, uh, and giving this opportunity for me to uh, share my experience of uh, working in this uh, disaster management sector for last 15, 20 years. So um, I haven't, uh, so what I've been thinking is that uh, study and today, uh, we have been getting a lot of uh, information on uh, the various theoretical aspects of disasters and different frameworks and, uh, you know, and uh, how do we, uh, you know, take on the DRR activities and uh, different dimensions of it. You know. I, I, so I'm, I was thinking that better not to get into that uh, theoretical discussion. Maybe I would, would be more, uh, uh, it would be better if I can share my experience of you know, working on uh, 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 DRR uh, programs in different parts of the world. Uh, and then maybe to practically look at some of the uh, best practices uh, or some of the practices and on DRR. Uh, which can be uh, more of traditional practices. It can be more of an organized, you know, innovative practices that has been supported by various international <coughs> funding agencies or donor agencies who are interested on DRR. So I hope I would be able to finish the discussion within the next 30 minutes. And maybe then if there is some questions we can take on later on. And also we'll give uh, the other speaker more time for explaining further, you know, further on the DRR. Um, maybe, uh, let me share the screen and uh, let, please let me know if you can see my screen. Come on, if you can confirm. Is it working or? Uh, Yes, it is visible. Uh, oh, okay. You can see the screen with the DRR best yeah, practices. That's yeah, right, right? Yeah. Okay. Right, yeah. Thank you. Um, let me put this in the full screen. All right. Um, <clears throat> so this picture, uh, what you see here is from Afghanistan, where uh, a remote community uh, members uh, in the northern part of Afghanistan, uh, they're planning for uh, 
you know, developing a disaster restriction plan. So this is part of a process that they initiated uh, where you would have heard sometime yesterday about hazard vulnerability capacity assessment, where this is a, a, it's a process where people assess the risk of the community and what different resources they have, what is some uh, different uh, capacities they have. And based on all the analysis, they come up with a DRR plan, disaster risk reduction plan. So uh, this picture, uh, I, I was part of this process in, uh, in 2013. Uh, so it, this happened in, in, in one of the you know, most vulnerable locations in Afghanistan. So just to say that, uh, you know, I mean, yesterday in the discussion, we have been listening about community-based practices. So this is very important that the community get involved in the disaster restoration planning, because that is what makes it more sustainable and effective. And uh, I'm not getting into, uh, you know, a lot of uh, technical discussion or, or the, the definition of DRR, et cetera. But, you know, in my understanding, whatever we do to reduce the risk of a disaster, to reduce the impact of a disaster is called, uh, you know, it's included in the DRR uh, uh, terminology. It's, it's like a disaster risk reduction, whatever we do. It can be a structural work at the community level. It can be a non-structural work. It can be a capacity building work. It can be an advocacy work with the government or uh, different stakeholders. So everything that you know results into a reduced risk in a community for the people who are vulnerable, that we call as DRR activities. So in that sense, uh, you know this has become uh, recently uh, recently this DRR has become such an important term because uh, you know the result of it is really appreciable. Like if you look at uh, one example, like in. In 1970, there was a uh, cyclone in Bangladesh, which killed uh, maybe half a million people there. And in, 2000, in 1991, there was another severe cyclone. Cyclone uh, that has uh, resulted in approximately 150,000 people losing their life. So that is where the since then Bangladesh has been, you know, they've been focusing too much on you know uh, some of the you know ways of reducing the risk. So they systematically the government has been putting in a lot of policies and practices and a lot of investment has gone in to build the capacity of community uh, to reduce the risk of a disaster, some on DRR activities and preparedness. So we, as a result of it, in, uh, if you look at again in 2007, Cyclone Siddha, like another, another, you know, one of the uh, deadliest kind of cyclone that happened there, it killed uh, less than 5,000 people. So you can, and, uh, you know, the number of people affected were less. So you can see the impact the result of it. And if you do a lot of preparedness uh, uh, activities, that can reduce uh, the impact of a disaster. So that is exactly what we are trying uh, through this DRR activities. You would have seen that recently, last uh, couple of years, we used to get a lot of cyclones in the in the in, in West Bengal and those Orissa, that part of it. So the the, the cyclone can be category four or you know, higher than that. But you know, in terms of the impact, we really I mean we can see then. Can hear the news of you know 100,000 people or even 10, 1 million people being evacuated so uh, by the government of Pariza or West Bengal. You know, that is the kind of preparedness that has happened, the capacity that understanding happened over a period of time. So, because of the evacuation, because of the, because of the uh, you know effective early warning system, um, then the impact has been reduced. So, that's all we want to get from this DRR uh, you know activity. We want the disaster to see sometime. It's very difficult to stop a disaster. You know, it happens, an earthquake happens, or a cyclone happens. We can't do much on stopping it, but we can do a lot of things to mitigate the impact of it. So this is what we have been doing now. Uh, if you go to Alapi in Kerala, you know, I've been there last I mean, two years back before this, uh, you know, COVID started. I was there, and then I saw a lot of new houses coming in in a, in a, in a elevated structure. They, they're, they're all pillars. You can see the houses built on pillars. So people are getting adapted to the flooding that happens, you know, more frequently these days. Uh, new houses constructed with some very good, you know, uh, concrete structures on pillars, so with, that can withstand the flooding, and also people's lives can be better when the flooding happens. You know, you won't, the house won't be sink in water. So that is the kind of adaptation, some uh, DRR work that happens in those communities. So these are some of the, you know, uh, people adapt. People adapt when when disasters happen frequently. Now, in, uh, for people of Kerala, there's no much choice than adapting. So you find a way to reduce the impact of it. You can see people talking of, uh, you know, I moved all my certificates and important documents to, an, you know, uh, to a, a structure, I mean, maybe upstairs, so that it won't get, you know, uh, uh, dis I mean, uh, destroyed in flood water. So people know what to do when a flood happens. They know how to 
prepare themselves. So that understanding, that education, that has to happen, and that through continuous practice, continuous uh, say uh, mock drills or something, you need to build that capacity within the community so that even if the flood happens, the the impact will be less. So uh, when you look around, uh, uh, you know, in different countries, uh, they have different different uh, level of uh, DR activities. You know, some countries are really good in. Uh, they are really good in, in DRR activities because of uh, maybe sometimes it becomes a matter of investment. You need the uh, you know financial investment or you need the commitment from the government, or you need to have a strong civil, civil society organizations, or you need to have a lot of NGOs who has that understanding, who has the resources and capacity to work with the communities to improve the uh, disaster preparedness. So different country, different organization, different com community community has different level of uh, you know DRR uh, practices. So this is uh, uh, just to say an example. I was talking of uh, Bangladesh, how they prepared a uh, pop cy uh, cyclone. You can see this is a cyclone shelter. So uh, it's on an elevated place. You know, you have you can see the structure has been built on pillars. And uh, so when there's a warning on, uh, uh, you know, there's an early warning on cyclone. See, these days we get uh, people track the cyclone uh, like one one week or even a month before. They know once the uh, cyclone is going to get formed, and after forming, they will track the route of it. So they know which area is going to hit. So people know when there's a warning on cyclone, so they know where to go. So people are used to using this evacuation center, which is built on pillars. So if there is a, a severe wind or even a surge of water, it won't affect them. So they come with their cattle, come with their you know, livestock. So all those livestock will be you know, uh, safely you know, tied under this uh, uh, you know, in the first floor. And then people go onto the, the top floor. So they will stay until the risk is over. So this is, uh, there, will, there will be a lot of cyclone shelters like this across Bangladesh, whichever is uh, vulnerable to uh, cyclones. Same thing happens in Orissa and uh, West Bengal. Like I said, we have uh, cyclone shelters and this is one way of you know reducing the risk of disaster. You get people stay in this place until the risk is over. So this, uh, uh, this is one of the mechanisms they have to reduce the risk of disaster. It's one practice I'm talking about, how DRR is undertaken. Second, you can see this is uh, when uh, Subhash is uh, talking of psychosocial work. I've been thinking of, uh, I started my career in, uh, in the disaster management sector as a psychosocial uh, trainer, and I was uh, sent to Sri Lanka soon after tsunami in 2004. So I've been, uh, whatever uh, Subhash has been talking about in terms of creating a character of psychosocial volunteers or teachers who can provide the immediate psychosocial support, uh, that uh, that's one part of a preparedness, or you know, I would say DRR. You can still uh, you know put that into that category. So this prepares part. So we created a cadre of you know psychosocial volunteers from the community, and also a lot of teachers were trained on psychosocial work. So using uh, the the resources provided by the enhance, which uh, uh, Subhash has shared now. So uh, on uh, the comprehensive uh, you know uh, umbrella of care kind of approach. So we train people so that when there is an emergency, next time they are they are all prepared to start the psychosocial, mediate the psychological support for people. So this is a kind of a DRR work we can do. And uh, I, I, when Subhashis was talking of that, I immediately got some pictures from my computer to show this is what the people have been doing and this is what we are expected to do. And uh, this was in 2005. And since then, uh, a lot of things changed, a lot of capacity has been built across India, across uh, different organizations, yeah. NGOs. They know uh, how to, you know, uh, work on psychosocial. Work. So there's a lot of support from Minhans who are uh, kind of steering this the initial uh, phase of uh, initial years of uh, emergency response. And uh, I mean, I, I don't want to miss this because it's very important. Uh, psychosocial. No. Uh, can you? Uh, the participants can please. Uh, Unmute, uh, mute themselves, please. Sorry, thank you. Um, so this is what on uh, one psychosocial part of it. And uh, if you go to the next slide, this is about, uh, uh, again, in Afghanistan, I've shown you the photo where people are discussing and sitting and discussing around DRR plans. And this is one of the DRR uh, interventions they have proposed. So that is, uh, you can see this is a gully. Gully, you can see between the mountain, there's a gully. And uh, normally in Afghanistan, what happens is very mountainous area where I work. And uh, that uh, gully erosion is very common there. You know, it, it will be a small gully, then later on uh, every year, the you know uh, the rainy season finishes and the, the gully expands. 
So it becomes it, it destroys the land. It is, uh, becomes you know access become difficult. So they used the local uh, you know means of you know sandbags etc to reduce the uh, so have this kind of check dam kind of thing where it can stop the uh, uh, erosion. So this is one. Just give an example how people plan for the you know they prioritize some of the disasters, some of the risk, and then find solution to uh, reduce it. So um, yeah, one 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 uh, good practice which I've seen, and you can see that uh, that's a very uh, the area have a lot of stones. Sometimes they use uh, you know stones to make this uh, 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 the you know kind of uh, structures, and sometimes it can be sandbag. You know? So they use the local resources to uh, do this work. And we have been doing this as a, as a cash for work intervention, where uh, we provide people, uh, you know, like we have, uh, you know, Toyla uh, Rapupadadi in Kerala. So we have this kind of cash for work, which actually employs the people to construct something beneficial for their community. So that way we ensure people are getting uh, sufficient, uh, you know, resources to lead their life. Plus it actually resulted, results in uh, some kind of structures which can withstand uh, or reduce the impact of disasters. And uh, now coming to this slide, this is actually from Rohingya camps in Bangladesh. I'm sure most of you would have heard about Rohingya refugee crisis that is happening currently, one of the largest uh, refugee crises in the world. And uh, uh, these, uh, you know, you know, Rohingyas, uh, Rohingya community people, they came from Myanmar and they took refuge in the border uh, districts of Cox's Bazar. I mean, in Bangladesh, it's called Cox's Bazar. In Cox's Bazar, uh, people have been staying in this kind of uh, uh, red areas where you can see the mountains. Uh, people stay on the on the slopes, and uh, different mounts, mountain. They will they will be living in different part of the mountain. It will be difficult for them to, uh, you know, go between uh, these mountains because in, in the rainy season it becomes difficult to access. So there will be a lot of uh, flooding happens on this area. So one of the project that did by it was uh, done by Christian here. You can see it's actually a bamboo structure connecting four mountains. So it's a bamboo bridge. Uh, you can you know that in Bangladesh, you know, bamboo is one of the, you know, local resource available and people are so much, you know, experienced in making bamboo structures. So this, uh, this is actually a disaster risk reduction uh, work that we did. It's a structural, structural disaster risk reduction work. And we are constructing some, uh, you know, structural uh, structures which can uh, reduce the impact. So people can uh, move uh, freely when even if there is a flooding, it can still people can still move around. They can take the uh, you know uh, they can access the hospital. They can access the you know, clinics within the camps. So this has been done by with the support of World Food Program uh, as part of Cash for Work program again. So this is uh, I'm just giving you a few examples from the camps, which were just a very classic example of you know structural mitigation work, structural uh, disaster risk reduction work. Um, and then you see the next slide, it's actually a walkway. So this, uh, this again, all this camp was set up in the mountain. It's very uh, slippery kind of, area. when it rains, it becomes very difficult to walk. And you can see in that uh, we have almost a million people staying in around 30 camps. So 1 million people out of that, you can see a huge percentage of uh, people, population are uh, differently able. So people with different, uh, differently able people, it becomes further difficult for them to move around, even to go to a latrine, which is maybe you know, 15, 20 meters away or even 50 meters away. It's difficult for them to walk through those muddy uh, uh, you know, areas. So what we did, we constructed uh, this uh, walkway, which is made of brick, uh, you know, it's like, like a lot of brick structures. So this again, uh, uh, between these uh, camps, we made this brick, uh, you know, path, pathways, so which help the community to easily access some of those areas even in the rainy season. Um, a lot of incident happens where people slip off from the mountain and, uh, you know, they fall into the gully and a lot of children get used to, you know, in the rainy season, they, they get drowned and many people used to get killed with landslides, actually. So we constructed a lot of structures which can reduce the impact of the disaster in the camps. And uh, that is, um, <clears throat> this is part of our D the, the DR activity that Kishnade has been doing. You can see another small bamboo uh, bridge. And, and also you can see uh, a stairway, which is made of uh, sandbags. So something is better than nothing. It's not like, it's actually a temporary structure. You know that the government of Bangladesh will not allow for a permanent structure in the camps. 
to the government. It's only now they are allowing for any concrete work to happen in the camp. And after three years, earlier in the beginning of uh, when the camp was started, there was no permission for anyone to construct anything permanent. So even the houses were like made of bamboo, which is three years now. They don't want any NGOs, any UN agencies to go and construct a semi-permanent or permanent houses because government think that uh, you know when you give such a facility here, none of these Rohingyas are going to go back to Myanmar. It means they are going to they, the Bangladesh will have to uh, host these refugees for a longer time. So they've not been allowing any permanent kind of work to happen in the beginning. So then we started working with uh, some of the you know uh, temporary structures like some of the temporary materials like. Uh, sandbags and stuff. At least people have a, a stairway to climb the hill or go to their home. So this has been uh, another structure that we, this example of VRR. And uh, you can see the here is a person with uh, disability standing. This is the advantage. And you can see on the side, there's a drainage, properly constructed drainage. You can, see, you can imagine when 1 million people, you know, one of the camps where we've been working, we have more than 60,000 people living in a small one square kilometer, one to two square kilometer area. So it's very congested. It's like uh, uh, maybe a slum in, in Mumbai. So in these uh, camps, these are not well-structured camps. These are just product, sporadic camps. You, you know, you don't have a proper drainage. There's no waste management system. So the camp becomes very unhygienic. And in the rainy season, the rainy season, uh, the, the chances of getting uh, contagious illness like, you know, cholera, other, you know, illness is very high because all the area get filled with the field uh, from those uh, houses. So uh, construction of uh, this drainage, proper drainage, reduces that risk, uh, you know, drastically. So all, all these houses were, uh, all the drainage from these houses were connected to this uh, main, uh, you know, main drain, and that they, uh, that has been properly treated at some point. All this development happened, you know, last, uh, you know, last one year because initially people were too much on setting up the basics. Then, then now all the agencies are investing on some, you know, uh, some further improvements on the camps. So some of the, the lot of, as I said, there are people with disability and it is so important that we make all those structures inclusive. So we don't, we want to make sure that uh, people with disability also has access and they can go to the washroom, they can access some of the health centers, they can, uh, so all the structures should be made in such a way that, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we think of uh, the, facility, uh, the facility as something which has to be accessible to this, uh, people, with, uh, people with different, uh, ability. So this is again from Rohingya camps, and uh, you can see now in recent times we constructed with the proper stairways with cemented, uh, you know, uh, platforms. So that has just improved, and you can still see that uh, many of the roofs they have kept a lot of stones, etc., so that in the wind, uh, you know, the, the roof will not be taken. So you can imagine when a cyclone happens, there's nothing. The, it, it, the, the whole roof goes with the stone. So still, uh, these structures are not, uh, you know, structurally safe during disaster. A lot of work to be done. As I said, the government is not allowing for a proper roofing or in a proper housing there. So still the structures are very much kind of temporary and unsafe. So this is access road plus drainage constructed by, uh, you know, again, uh, through the support of World Food Program in Rohingya camps. So this has actually changed the lives of people. You know, they are not much worried of rainy, rainy season now because they know they have an access road. They have, there's a drainage. So Sorry, someone's uh, unmuted. Please. Yeah. Um, okay, coming back, these are uh, some of the uh, you know, typical uh, you know, uh, DRA work that we always do in Assam. You can see this is uh, you know, the areas which are vulnerable to flooding. You can see the latrines made an elevated platform. So it becomes, and you can see even a, um, a, you know, a borehole or what you call the, the hand pumps on an elevated platform so that uh, during uh, flood season, they can still access those facilities. So this is what we are, uh, you know, talking of some of the, you know, good practices and people are adapting so that otherwise during rainy season, this, uh, you know, hand pumps will be submerged or the latrines will be submerged in water so people cannot use it. Now, with this kind of a simple modification, some, uh, you know, uh, simple structures, they can, they can access those, uh, uh, you know, those facilities. And this is something which I've seen in Cambodia. I mean, it's not just in Cambodia. If you go to Azam in Northeast, you can see a lot of structures made uh, like this on the, on the pillars. So these are the houses and uh, on, the, on pillars and the bottom part of it, the ground, uh, you know, ground floor is used for uh, sometimes for livestock, sometimes people use it for their socializing and stuff. 
and uh, and it will stay on the on the on the first floor. So it is basically safe from flooding. So this is um, this is one example, one one of the you know practice which is very commonly seen in some part of Cambodia where people are vulnerable to flooding. And I was also seen in Cambodia there is a whole uh, a village which is floating. It's a floating village. And floating village means people construct uh, their houses on boats. So you keep two three boats together and construct a house there. And then you can see houses, you can see market, you can see the uh, the petrol filling station. Everything is floating in that lake. So it's a huge lake there, and people live in that. And and because in you know it doesn't when there is a flooding annual uh, flooding happens, it won't affect their life because they are still floating. So they can move around. They can move from one place. They can move their house from one place to another place. So the kind of adaptation happens. And I, I don't have that photo right now. I mean, I should have got it. But then um, there's an example how uh, people you know adapt to uh, some of this impact of climate change and uh, disasters. Um, yeah, this is another flood shelter from Assam, uh, which again um, uh, during flooding people come. When, when they get early warning, when the flooding happens, people know there is a place for them to go and stay for a few days, and uh, that will be working as a you know refugee. I mean, it's a, a relief camp, so people will be getting um, you know relief from government or even at least they the community manage themselves with some of the resources available. So this is uh, a basic structure, you know, flood shelter which is in uh, seen in Assam. Um, <clears throat> then. Okay, you can see that this is actually a village in Cambodia. Uh, most of the houses are, you know, even the you know, shops on the side, they're all pillars. So it's an interesting, uh, very remote, it's not actually a remote village. This was somewhere in 2008. Uh, and the Cambodia is like, some part of Cambodia is like 20 years behind, uh, 20, 30 years behind Kerala. You can see, you can feel like it's like Kerala village in those days, but yeah. Again, you see some of the uh, traditional houses in Cambodia built on, you know, wooden pillars, not even concrete. They use those wooden pillars and then construct their houses on on these pillars. When you look at this picture, uh, you can see a big mud kind of fort. It's a huge one. This is used in Ghana, uh, so to save or store their grains. So this is actually, <clears throat> uh, you know, you know that. Um, in some of those places, you know, drought is very common, won't get enough <coughs> water. <coughs> so it's important for you to prepare for the lean season. <coughs> so what they do, what they do is uh, they construct such a big mud port and they have partitions within that mud port, a huge one. And uh, they, they store maize and other, you know, uh, a kind of, um, you know, their uh, grains, you know, in that store, storage. So this is uh, it is very traditional way of uh, risk, you know reducing the risk. So what happens? People preserve the food <clears throat> so that during a you know a dry season they still have uh, you know access to some of the basic foods. Uh, so this happens at sometime at the household level, sometime at the community level. Uh, so uh, this is an example where you can see. I mean, it, it's actually from northern part of Ghana, which I've seen in uh, I think it's again in two thousand eight. It's a place called Tamali. So there might be a lot of <clears throat> other traditional ways of doing it. Um, and then this is uh, again from Ghana. You see people are, uh, uh, you know, making plants. You know, this is actually how do they plan? They find, uh, they do a lot of analysis, you know, problem tree. So they find out the root force of disasters and try to adjust the root force so that there will be less disasters coming up. So the, say at the community level, a lot of work, has, work happens like this, where you involve the community to analyze the issue and uh, find solution for that. So these are some of the kind of exercise they do uh, as part of community-based disaster risk reduction activities. And you see here, this is, uh, you know, uh, there's not enough, uh, there's not enough water. It's a drain, I mean, it's a dry area in, in, one, some, in the northern part of Ghana. You can see the, Rainwater harvesting happens. So, in school level, you have a water tank. So, they collect all the water from the roof and you know they store it in the in the, the tank which is kept there. And then this is used during the you know, dry season. It's again, if you look at the house's structure, it's a tin sheet, uh, and then it is not properly fixed to the uh, the, the house. So, in the in the when the cyclone happens, when there's a heavy rain, a heavy wind, it takes off the uh, the the roof. 
So it's all important that uh, as part of DRR work, what we have to do here is to you know ensure this is properly structure is properly built and then it's properly fixed to the, the, the roof. The roof, the sheet has been properly fixed so that the roof uh, it won't uh, the, the cyclones will not uh, impact the, the the safety of those people sleeping there. And uh, yes, this is again. Uh, yeah, this is from Ethiopia uh, where you can see. Um, uh, people again, they get some rain in some time, and there's a lot of uh, there's a drought season as well. So even when there's a water available from the stream, uh, uh, they don't have uh, enough. They what they do is they construct small check dams on the streams and then use the water to uh, you know to water those uh, their agriculture stuff, which which is like far away from those water source. So construct the check dam, then have some small small streams to you know or to to the, the, the vegetation area and then they plant the water. These are, uh, <clears throat> you know, these are some innovative ways of, you know, uh, how people use the existing resources to reduce the impact or to make the best use of the available resources to uh, ensure their livelihoods are sustainable and, you know, it's like more resilient. This is like another example of DRR is like, you know, you use um, drought resistant varieties of seeds. So drought is very common. So there, there are a lot of research happening on, you know, it, uh, you know, coming up some seeds, which is more resistant to the droughts. So that can withstand the drought period. So and still, you know, keeping the the trees uh, standing. So that gives. Otherwise, what happens? People start planting, and at some time, you won't get enough water, and all those uh, agriculture goes in vain, and then uh, people are they starving without any any yield. So this. Uh, drought resistant varieties of seeds uh, actually help people to find, uh, at least to find some solutions, find some respite from this uh, drought. So this example is <clears throat> from uh, Ethiopia. <clears throat> this is from uh, Nepal. Where this project was part of uh, a project funded by European Commission where, again, uh, you know, elevated structure where you have water pumps uh, have been kept on elevated structures so that during uh, flood season, I mean, all this area get flooded then uh, this uh, structure is still accessible um, and uh, people still can use uh, you know proper drinking water during flood season and a lot of issue around you know paper get you know, the water getting contaminated from flood water but i think that but there are ways to uh, manage that uh, by treating the uh, you know the, the, the water in, in these uh, bore well this is from, uh, again, this is from Nepal. Yeah, and you can see here, uh, I think sometime also, I was also referring to some of the community of preparedness. The same village in, in Nepal, they have a community committee, they have a place where people stock all those first aid, <coughs> first aid and response materials. You can see in that screen, uh, in that, uh, they know what are the you know in instruments, what are the tools which has been kept in that place, and somebody has a lock and key for, I mean, and there are people responsible to manage that and maintain that. And there's a logbook where they, they, they may, you know, maintain all the materials available, how to use it, who is responsible for that. So when the, when the flood happens or any other uh, earthquake happens, a disaster happens, people know there are materials available for search and rescue. There's a community committee who is responsible. They have been trained on how to use the search and rescue equipment. So they are the first responders. When an emergency happens, the community people themselves can go and you know, respond to the disaster. They can save lives. You know, in a disaster, the first few hours are very important. Before anybody comes with, uh, you know, the fire department comes with their equipment, it takes maybe half a day or one day, you know, sometimes based on the location, it takes time. So the community are there already. So if they have the capacity, they can respond and they can save lives. So you can see in the in Kerala also recent uh, landslide, it took a lot of time for the heavy machinery to reach the location uh, to save people's lives, you know. So that's the time, that's the importance of, improving the capacity of local community uh, and provide them, provide them with sufficient equipments and training on uh, using those uh, first aid and certain rescue equipments. So this um, example, okay, this is from Somaliland. This is actually Somaliland is, is part of Somalia, uh, just uh, you know, uh, north of Somalia. So Somaliland, uh, just you can see, interestingly, these are currencies, uh, this is a currency exchange place. I don't know, the photos are very clear. But this is how they, yeah, this is one of the marketplace. You can see the very temporary makeshift kind of market where the tea shops, people are coming out of the tea shops, very basic structures. They don't have enough facilities. You know, I was traveling to one of the remote locations in Somalia 
and this is what I've seen on the way to Somaliland uh, on those locations. So when you travel to that remote location, the main problem there uh, for them is water because they get maximum two to three rains or maybe four rains in a year. That's it. And there's no rain for the rest of the year. So what they have and the water, the groundwater table is so low that you can't go, you know, sometimes you dig a, you know, uh, you know, well, which is like uh, 300 feet, 400 feet, sometimes 600 feet, still you won't get water. So what do they do is they can, they make such a, a kind of earthen dam, like you know, a structure, a big pond, and then collect all the water into this uh, pond. So during that, even the three, four rains, what they get, they have channels that leads to this uh, pond and all the water, uh, you know, all the rainwater, it, it comes to this place and then they use it, uh, they, uh, they preserve it for using it in the, the, in the dry season. So it becomes a source of water for animals, the livestock and also for people. So this is one way of uh, DRR, uh, you know, an example of a disaster reduction work that happens in Somali land. <clears throat> Another one, if you look at the structure, I don't know if you can see the photos clearly, is again underground uh, kind of uh, water storage. So all the water that, uh, all the rainwater is being uh, directed to this underwater storage tank, and it is being covered with the roof so that, you know, the, the sun will not, uh, you know, evaporate the water. So this would be whatever water they collect, you know, in that tank, it will be, be given like a ration for the community members. There is, everybody knows how many liters of water they can get. So there is a system where they manage the distribution, but the storage is so important that, you know, rest of the year, they have to depend on these not just for people to drink and uh, for household work, but also for livestock and their livelihood. So water is such a precious uh, you know, uh, resource in, uh, in those areas and they preserve it. All drops of water have been preserved. These are like traditional ways and it's not like no one is, it's like they use their own uh, ideas to come up with something, uh, some structures like this. And uh, there are also some water taps constructed by NGOs like ours, but then sometimes it won't be as, uh, you know, you won't be, uh, uh, getting water from the source all the time. And uh, yeah, this is how, again, under underground water, this is how they construct this, uh, you know, the water tank. So this will be covered with roofing, there's a sheet, so that, uh, you know, the water stands there. You can see from one corner, the water is coming, uh, or there's a, there's a channel which can take all the water to this. You can see how people, they, they commute, they, they transport the water in, uh, uh, on the dongi in the, in the water cans. Uh, yeah, and this is like a more structured kind of pond. Again, in, in, in uh, Somali, you can see that people are using water. There's some camels and cattle around that place, uh, uh, around this water tank, uh, and then they they use this for rest I mean, uh, during the dry uh, dry season. I'm just rushing because we have only a few minutes. Uh, again, this is an example how do we how we did the community level, so school level disaster preparedness work or uh, in Fiji. Uh, children were trained on, you know, how to respond uh, when there's an earthquake happens. So you do a lot of mock drills, you, you teach them how to respond, how to behave when the earthquake happens. So the mock drill, the practice that makes them, you know, uh, react uh, appropriately when the earthquake happens. So this has been part of some of the mock drills uh, that, uh, that has been given uh, at the school level. So. Uh, School-based disaster preparedness work is also very important, and uh, it has a. Uh, Sometimes, uh, you know, earthquake happens, and children might be in the school. They are, they they, should, they may be in the class. So that time they are at high risk because uh, they can get killed if they don't know how to uh, safe uh, safeguard themselves in, a, in a, during an earthquake. So we give a lot of training. Uh, we do a lot of mock drills, and we develop disaster management plans and risk reduction plans so that. Um, Children know how to, you know, uh, how to evacuate, how to uh, go under the table, or you know, we say duck cover hole kind of you know, like you, they know what to do, uh, the best they can do within the class. So these are a few uh, community-based examples. Again, uh, this is uh, an example from Afghanistan. The landslide happened; the whole village was buried, buried under water. I mean, under this uh, mud, and they've been moved into refuge the camps next to that mountain. So even that camp is not safe. You can see it's on the slope and there's a big gully on the other side and any uh, further landslide can kill them. But then within the camps, you have been constructing a lot of you know, latrines and uh, stuff so that it can reduce the uh, further spread of any cholera kind of epidemics or you know, any other uh, illness. So a lot of work you can do in those uh, re in relief camps as well. Um, yes, I think I'm done with some of those uh, examples and I'm also 
aware that uh, just uh, three minutes left on uh, available time. So maybe I'll stop here. And uh, if at all you have any questions later on or now, fine, happy to take it. Or maybe I'll hand over to uh, Shifra, right? Yeah, uh, for you to take it further. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I, uh, it was a very wonderful session. And uh, you have listed all the best practices in DRR. Uh, mentioned about the cyclone shelter in Bangladesh and also you uh, being the social uh, psychosocial volunteer in Sri Lanka. You spoke about the practice of uh, check dams with sandbags in Afghanistan, Rohingya camps in Bangladesh and Cambodia's example, also the example of food shelter in Assam. So it was a uh, very wonderful. Thank you for the uh, session. And um, uh, questions, uh, the participants can uh, put their questions in the chat box. We'll take it after the last session of uh, this uh, training program, second day of training program. So next I welcome our third, uh, third session, um, Dr. Rajiv M.M., Assistant Professor, Department of Social Work, Central University of Rajasthan. He has completed his PhD in the field of disaster management. Dr. Rajiv uh, worked actively with a number of humanitarian organizations in, uh, in tsunami interventions and in other dis uh, disasters. Uh, his area of research interest includes uh, disaster hey. management, DRR. Yeah. And uh, welcome, sir. Yeah, you can write. Over to you. Yes, yeah, yeah. Take a second. Yeah, you can write. Yes, yes, uh, good afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So good afternoon, participants. And uh, I think, you know, I hope this uh, is a very good opportunity to, to discuss. Uh, I think I use the word discuss because uh, Mr. Vivek had a very detailed presentation on disaster risk regression best practices. And I think we traveled uh, uh, almost uh, more than five or six countries right now. Bangladesh, uh, in Afghanistan, all these countries. He presented uh, a lot of uh, DRR uh, practical lessons and uh, capacity building programs, how the community is involved in the DRR process. All these things are uh, wonderfully being learned. And I hope that you know, last yesterday onwards, uh, the participants are uh, learning various theoretical and uh, practical exposures, practical uh, knowledge about disaster risk creation and uh, risk management. Uh, the basic concept. And uh, the first two speakers uh, very detailed explained about the, the first speaker about the psychosocial care at the community level and uh, uh, Dr. Subhash Sar's experiences while working with a number of agencies. And uh, of course, uh, Vivek already I mentioned. <clears throat> I think you now uh, always uh, we need to, uh, the people, we are worried about the investments and uh, including me and you all people are, uh, worried about investment like you know uh, property investment bank investment everything but uh, we really need to look into the investment of uh, uh, like you know disaster risk creation the the local community and the government needs to be utilized and needs to be invest on disaster risk creation investment in terms of uh, knowledge knowledge and skills and practical aspects you know the, in terms of uh, providing training program and educating or sensitize the people level about the various spheres of disaster risk creation and management you know? all these are the critical uh, need and requirement uh, which uh, we need to be understand uh, uh, invest our knowledge our inputs then only a resilient country on a resilient disaster resilient uh, country or the place we can obtain I think uh, uh, the, whatever the knowledge uh, we, we obtained from the last uh, couple of uh, sessions, uh, we need to look into knowledge into action. And uh, my uh, presentation, I, I will, I think, uh, uh, based around these uh, action plan, action plan of disaster risk reduction. And I will explain about the critical or crucial role of various stakeholders uh, in uh, uh, drafting and implementing disaster risk reductions. And again, of course, I will justify myself uh, rather than not much going to the theoretical aspects. Uh, I will look into the, the practical aspects, you know, practical uh, learned uh, from uh, work with the Action Aid and other experienced agencies. I will also uh, explain some of the, the field level uh, yeah, uh, exploration, which I utilized. So one second, I will uh, uh, share my screen.
Yeah, Shipra, madam, it's visible, right? Yes, sir, it's visible, but I request you to uh, put it in uh, full screen, please. Full screen, okay, okay. Now it's okay. Now it's okay, madam? No, oh, no, sir. No, sir. No. Yeah. I think uh, there's an icon in the bottom side. It's fine, sir. Thank you, sir. It's okay. Okay, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Then uh, uh, definitely, no, we need to look into the, the uh, practical steps uh, which are uh, uh, related to the disaster risk regression. And my focus uh, today is basically about the concept of disaster risk regression and the milestones. Milestone here I emphasize about the, the various policies and uh, framework which already uh, explained yesterday. So I'm not going to discuss about that. But anyway, it's a basically it's an introduction step. I will share the, the, the basic milestone uh, which are existing or uh, yeah, paved the way for the disaster risk in the country uh, and disaster risk at the global level. Asian countries, uh, just three or four countries, I have taken a sample of uh, already, uh, Mr. Vivek Sikha mentioned about the uh, South Asian countries, how they are yeah, managed or how they are implemented disaster risk regressions. And preparation for action plan is the most significant uh, yeah, point which I included. And uh, the next uh, uh, slide, you know, which I included, like the recognizing uh, numerous uh, various actors for disaster risk regression. This uh, may create a lot of difference because this is highly required and uh, we, we should know about you know, uh, whose responsibility in tackling disaster, whose responsibility is lied upon managing and uh, uh, making appropriate strategy for disaster intervention. So those things uh, which we need to understand very thoroughly. And uh, uh, community mapping exercises and disaster risk question planning, which I have not changed the slides, which I have used in the last uh, NIADM training program. And I, I did not change the slides, uh, the photograph, but anyway, uh, I will show some of the uh, uh, interventions made by community in uh, making the disaster resilient activities in the respective areas. And uh, you know that uh, disaster risk regression and uh, no need to uh, define the concept of disaster risk regression. And basically, you know that uh, uh, disaster risk regression is one of the important method which we can say that uh, the people should need to be come together and identification of uh, risk, assessment of the risk, analysis of uh, multiple risk in the, yeah, in the particular hazard area and uh, inclusion of the uh, different vulnerable sectors and uh, addressing the, the pivotal issues of the vulnerable sections of society. All these uh, are comes under the, the concept of disaster risk regression. And uh, it is uh, the right time, no? It is the right time we should know about to review the existing uh, disaster risk regression initiatives at the country level or international level. And uh, you know that uh, disaster risk regressions uh, basically uh, focus upon the uh, planning and uh, implementation level, planning and implementation, implementation level. And if you look at the, the reviews, the recent uh, dynamism, recent activities of disaster discretion, we can identify that the key focus of the DRR program on strengthening institutions uh, for disaster discretion at the village level, district level, and state and national level. Strengthening the different institutions are one of the important uh, yeah, the area of disaster discretion. And uh, you know that developing capacities uh, for this uh, risk vulnerability assessment, developing capacities at the various levels, community level and education institution level, uh, research level and community level. These uh, various levels of uh, capacity assessment and capacity development is one of the important uh, uh, areas of disaster risk creation and inclusion of uh, disaster risk creation in the urban areas like, you know, you know that smart cities and uh, most populated cities, uh, how disaster risk creation needs to be uh, planned and accordingly, all these things are needs to be important. And disaster management legislations, of course, uh, there are uh, various laws and acts are uh, passed by the uh, government in 2005 Act, 2009 disaster management policy, you know, all these, uh, uh, the legal framework, which definitely uh, direct us to how to uh, work in disaster situations. And the recent, uh, uh, the, the, the health conduct, health COVID and uh, pandemic, uh, which uh, 
definitely uh, open up an eye because uh, how uh, uh, a state government, how a central government, how a bottom local government can need to be work in a very difficult circumstances. In Disaster Management Act, the 2005 Disaster Management Act, it's clearly emphasized, specified the, the each actor's specific role in managing uh, natural and man-made disasters. The next slide, uh, which I am going to discuss about. Uh, Sorry. Yes, disaster risk reduction milestones and policies. And all these uh, international level and uh, global uh, framework for disaster risk reduction, Sendai framework, uh, and global assessment report, GA. They are, and all these things uh, definitely given a direction to how to work with the communities, how to work with the local people or vulnerable section society uh, to deal in a, a disaster uh, whenever it arises. And uh, you can see the disaster risk reduction at the at the global level. And uh, definitely we need to look into uh, understand the global level scenario, global context of uh, natural disasters and disaster risk reduction policies and uh, part with the uh, global uh, UN framework. And you know that uh, uh, if you look at the USA, United States of America, disaster risk reduction policies, disaster risk reduction, we can see an integration, integration of the national policy and the uh, integrated approach by uh, adding and uh, uh, institutionalizing the different sectors like a participation and using the mobilization of uh, different sectors and the key role of the governance and health, the focus on the health and other networks and uh, building of infrastructure like disaster resilient communities, disaster resilient building, etc., are uh, basically uh, the, the, the true focus of the United States of America. And uh, a number of uh, organizations like American Red Cross Society and uh, International Federation of Red Crescent and Red Cross, all these uh, yeah, very international agencies are uh, primarily working with the people, working with the uh, local partners to understanding the, uh, the, the type of disaster risk and, to, and the way to find out the uh, best strategies to uh, reduce or mitigate the disaster effects. And if you look at the uh, another country like Australia, are more focused on the emergency alert system because the national level, the, the team which consists of the like a task group like medical assistance and livelihood focus and infrastructure communication. See, all these emergency uh, management resources are uh, ready at an action whenever a disaster strikes. So these two uh, uh, countries are focusing on disaster reduction in uh, specifically addressing and understanding, analyzing the policies and uh, integration of uh, various resources. And we need to know about the Asian countries like Indonesia, China. Uh, in Indonesia, of course, it's uh, one of the important, uh, yeah, very disaster affected places, vulnerable loca locations uh, in the Asian level. We can see that uh, that's putting children at the heart of disaster risk reduction. And we know that uh, the children are the, I think a uh, lot of uh, vulnerabilities we can see that and working with the children, addressing the different issues of the children is almost important in disaster risk reduction. And uh, uh, putting children in front of the disaster risk reduction activities and uh, uh, planning the school uh, 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 infrastructure and uh, school curriculum and adding appropriate guidelines uh, uh, to, to adhere for the welfare of the children and for the security of the children in the disaster risk reduction is the most important. And countries like India actually initiated such initiatives like states like Gujarat and other uh, states already started with the support of the uh, national level organization, uh, putting children and putting the school uh, uh, like a friendly spaces and uh, understanding the, the, the importance of disaster risk reduction and uh, 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 just handholding support to the, the most vulnerable sites. So this is one of the important uh, intervention which we can see in the Asian level and uh, the drones, which uh, of course China used for the uh, delivering food and other articles and apart, of course, this is a part of the disaster response, but still no disaster mitigation effort. Uh, they used to understand and analyze the, the number of risks associated with the disasters. So they used to visit the different vulnerable localities like, you know, and uh, understand the the, the, the signal, understand the volume of risk and find out the way how to address all these risks in a very participatory manner. So uh, if you look at the example from the countries like you know, uh, uh, China and Nepal, uh, China is uh, the first photograph, you know, basically putting effort to making a disaster resilient and disaster risk reduction activities at the yeah, uh, basic level. And look at the children, those who are uh, slowly training, get ready for such sort of uh, yeah, a disaster 
facilitation and, and preparedness programs at the uh, grassroots level and village level. And uh, you know that Nepal is uh, almost uh, was witnessed in 2015, witnessed 2013 to 15, witnessed the, the mass, uh, earth, massive earthquake which destroyed the almost 50% uh, of the assets. So all these uh, things uh, are called for a wake up call for the country like uh, uh, Nepal and Bangladesh and other countries which uh, are focused much on the disaster risk creation and they're already advanced uh, in disaster, investing disaster risk creation for their better disaster management program. And you know that uh, this slides uh, discuss about the preparation for action plan on disaster risk creation. Appropriate strategy and coordination, coordination from the higher level and uh, of course the government level and NGO level consultation, all these things are mandatory for disaster risk creation. Because unless or until without a, a coalition, without a network, without a crucial participation, without a uh, appropriate strategy, the disaster risk creation program cannot be sustained. So it is uh, the responsibility of the people, it is the responsibility of the government, it is the responsibility of the, uh, the civil society organizations to, to involve and to attract appropriate strategies for disaster risk creation. Of course, communication, advocacy, and partnership is crucial for disaster risk creation. And if you look at the, the planning level, and if you look at the action level, that the communication, like uh, the, the technological advancement, uh, that, that is most importantly the significant in the disaster risk creation and disaster risk management program. Advocacy, the policy level, and uh, of course, the action level, that is most important, and partnership with uh, multiple organizations, those who can provide uh, support in terms of uh, the resources like you know, disaster resilient programs and capacity building training program, appropriate funding, appropriate uh, yeah, uh, remedial measures and risk reduction measures. See, all these uh, partnerships and advocacy communications are needs to be worked together for the effective delivering disaster risk reduction measures. Competency build capability building and capacity building or capability buildings needs to be a frame, it needs to be based based, skill based, competency driven. So the people, those who are getting the training, those who are uh, getting appropriate uh, capacities uh, by getting training program and other workshops, definitely needs to be utilized, it needs to be channelized, it needs to be transformed into action. That needs to be one. That the peer educators technique and uh, training is trainers of training, all these can be uh, instrumental in uh, providing appropriate training for the disasters management and uh, research, technological development, knowledge management, you know, investing on uh, learning and uh, improving our wisdom. Of course, uh, that is an inevitable part of uh, disaster resolution. Basically, this preparation, preparation for disaster, uh, uh, pre disaster management and disaster risk reduction is uh, one of the important steps which we need to be incorporated in the, our development planning and our day-to-day -day life. And recognizing uh, uh, various actors in disaster risk reduction. This is the, uh, the fruitful slide which uh, we need to be expand. I'm not much going to discuss the each uh, uh, the uh, respondents or each uh, 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 participants uh, exiled role, but of course we need to know about the local communities uh, several times, you know, several times mentioned in this platform, the local community is the first reservoir, first responder uh, that we can accept because, you know, the local community needs to be uh, trained, needs to be sensitized, needs to be analyzed the, the disaster situations as well, so that the crucial role of the community is inevitable and uh, the local self-government's role, because you know that uh, local self-government government can be easily uh, yeah, coordinate with the uh, local uh, resources and uh, their pivotal role is uh, much uh, needs to be discussed. And one of the organizations uh, already, uh, we, we got experience from the previous speaker, uh, how one uh, 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 of the organization working in the different countries and how they are, I think, uh, uh, amplifying the, the resources, how they are coordinating the resources, how they are providing the resources in a very, very good manner. These things are most important so because uh, I, I personally know that working with agencies uh, like Action ID, it's Care India, we used to do uh, provide you know, disaster support services and not only the disaster response in terms of uh, you know disaster preparedness prevention participation and uh, of course planning planning disaster resilient uh, communities uh, this uh, the volunteer organization role is uh, very very important and central state district bodies already in existing in india and support from the institution like national institute of disaster management and various committees and state uh, state disaster management unities revenue department there are many many uh, institutional uh, bodies institutional bodies and departments are already uh, united already uh, adhering the roles and responsibility of the disaster uh, risk creation programs and uh, you know you will look into the the, the critical uh, or crucial of the community community itself now needs to be 
uh, uh, involved in the planning for exercise and disaster resolution planning. And basically with the support of the uh, other institutions of the government, other NGOs, the community can be facilitated, community can be facilitated in the disaster mapping exercises, which definitely need to look into the, identify the potential risk areas and what sort of uh, mechanism, what sort of uh, uh, remedies or uh, solution can be done in a, a very cohesive manner can be planned. So these uh, mapping exercises, which we look into the identify the most vulnerable localities, locations in the particular area, which in a uh, in a very participative manner, though the local uh, community uh, can be uh, instrumental, can be participate in these exercises because they they can easily identify and draw the map with the support of the the technical team. And community volunteers, you know, that community members or community facilitators, integrated program technicians, all these, uh, uh, the, the framework, all these, uh, the populations and the, the, the needs to be trained, their capacity needs to be improved in terms of uh, uh, getting a, a proper understanding of the, the, the disaster risk creation and how to help the local people uh, during the time of a disasters. And you know that the, the, pro the program like a sensitization, educational sensitization program among the community, that should be planned. So this is, of course, as a part and part of the disaster risk reduction program. And a well-planned sensitization program can be done in the, at the community level with the incalculation of you know, a number of uh, yeah, yeah, support from the other institutions and government, other collaborative partners. And you know that the woman uh, become, comes first and they are uh, dealing, they are, they are interacting with others, they are, I think, uh, conducting sensitization program as the community, at their own locality level, definitely will speak much and disaster risk reduction activities and understanding the culture, understanding the, the significance of the, the local need and the, the emergence of the, uh, the requirement. Of course, you know, the disaster risk reduction activities can be planned at the community level. And participation of the children, participation of the women, that definitely will help in reducing the disaster impact. Of course, the uh, livelihood restorations and other uh, sectors definitely, and the psychosocial impact, of course, that can also uh, plan in a very disaster risk reduction program. So that will uh, definitely result in reducing the yeah, severity, re reduce the severity in the when a disaster strikes. So participatory action, definitely a review and a reflections of community-based activities and uh, mock drilling exercises, definitely that will help the community to understand the type of risk which they are facing. And normally the, the kind of a, a coordination can be ensured whenever a, a disaster arises. So of course the calamity can be uh, uh, create a lot of uh, spaces for reunity, the people to understand about the various yeah, participatory activities and uh, this definitely is much required in a most disaster uh, protect disaster prone areas and key action for a uh, community mobilization definitely you know that you need uh, to mobilize the resources like uh, men and uh, the personal involvement like involving leaders local groups religious organization government system accessing structures that needs to be uh, communicate communicated their participation needs to be ensured in a disaster risk reduction effort as is the, the political, social, and security environment, no? issues of power, decision-making, and uh, identifying the, the cultural rules and regulations, those needs to be respected, but should be incorporated in the disaster risk reduction plan. So basically, it's not an, a very easy task, but uh, understanding the, the significance of the, uh, the potential risk, the people should be uh, evolved, the people should be effectively evolved in the disaster risk reduction programs and key action of uh, community mobilization. The talk with the, the various key informants, no? and facilitate the participation of the vulnerable section society, establish a sufficient space uh, for planning and dissemination of the, uh, the various in information. No? All these things uh, definitely help the community to identify the risk at the right time. And uh, it's definitely will help in the, the intervention in a, in appropriate way. Facilitate uh, community self-help and social support. This is again comes under the community, uh, uh, the role of the communities, you know, identifying community resources, it's most important step and accessibility and uh, utilization also of the support and the realization of about all these resources. The community needs to be identified the, uh, the, the umbrella of resources that are available in the particular community. So those awareness, you know, those sensitization, those learning, those inputs, and those awareness definitely help the community to understand the, the significance of the disaster risk creation. And you know that mapping exercise already we discussed about the it can be used uh, different participatory methods, resource mapping and uh, uh, PRA techniques, which definitely help the community to to uh, revisit about the, the the past risk which are associated with their daily life. 
And this slide, you know, is I, I did not uh, made any any points in the particular slide. The role of government in disaster management, of course, you know that the government is responsible for the longer term development, longer term development and uh, visibilities of its uh, area. The local self government is uh, required to consider and uh, institute a disaster risk reduction in the day to day activities of the uh, uh, the government. And the, the government should incorporate the the uh, disaster risk reduction ideas and uh, uh, the programs in the day to day planning. So the government's uh, the role is very crucial, and uh, of course, you know, as a researcher, uh, I can able to understand about the the various uh, uh, number of activities, number of roles the government can be taken uh, at, at the most care uh, during the time of disaster or the pre-disaster or disaster risk measures. The government needs to be coordinated. The government needs to be act as a coordinator or a facilitator and act as a consultant to, to identifying the various support system available within a community or in a disaster affected area or disaster prone area government should be needs to be understand the or develop a support support mechanisms support mechanism support system that should be equally uh, significant in the uh, purview of disaster management and you know that uh, NGOs, uh, corporates, and other sectors are also important in the disaster risk reduction program. Public participation and uh, public-private partnership. All these uh, emerged, emerging areas are nowadays proving uh, because uh, this is a, a very inevitable partnership is required for a effective rebuilding of the disaster affected areas. And you know that uh, the external aid, external aid is. Uh, of course, uh, most important. And uh, you know that uh, number of organizations, international aided organizations of both in India in the various uh, uh, times, various uh, phases of disaster. In the Gujarat, uh, 2002 onwards, and the, the, the recent uh, uh, floods in the South India, which proved the external aid is one of the important uh, 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 help or support can be used for the, the development of the disaster response mechanisms and of course the, the community-based disaster preparedness and other activities. Much. And uh, of course, yeah, yeah, I will minimize in another one or two, one or two minutes. And uh, livelihood planning is uh, especially working with the Care India in Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which identified the, 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 the role of uh, women, which are very, very significant in identifying the disaster risk and uh, extending the support services. So consultative engagement, disaster risk reduction, the share, of course, I mentioned this is a shared responsibilities uh, of may, based upon the identifying the disaster risk area and providing an umbrella of different uh, institutional support. The consultative engagement in disaster uh, management is most important stuff. And basically, the, this is the last slide which I am going to discuss about disaster risk reduction planning. And uh, there are six, seven steps which are used to be important in the disaster action plan. Initial awareness and rapport building is the most important step. And uh, of course, the uh, uh, providing a sensitization about the different risk and identifying the potential opportunities for uh, working for a disaster risk reduction is most important. So rapport building is a very, very significant step. And understanding the, the community profile, village profile, uh, where the disaster risk needs to be incorporated or needs to be implemented and the mobilization of the resources either uh, of course the uh, uh, mass meetings and cultural activities uh, of course uh, street plays and other different methodology can be utilized for mobilizing the community to understand and uh, working with the disaster risk reduction program and the collection of informations by using the different uh, technological and other information system can be deployed in the disaster or prone area and formation of disaster management team including early warning uh, rescue first aid, psychosocial, all these uh, uh, the different thematic head can be uh, incorporated and to make a, a appropriate team for uh, a strong action whenever a disaster arises. The capacity building only we discussed and the rehearsals and mock drills definitely will help the community to, to, to understand the, uh, the effectiveness of their program, effectiveness of their preparations, you know, which can be instrumental in disaster management program. And of course, the skills and knowledge definitely can be improved through a different dialogical and conversational kind of this workshop. People can be incorporated, people can be, the ideas can be shared in different platform, uh, definitely needs to be shared. And that can be one of the yeah, important step for knowledge or learning practices. The appropriate skills needs to be yeah, provided, needs to be uh, implemented, it needs to be uh, trained. That's most part of the disaster management. You can get the information like a prevention website and the website and national Suit disaster management it's a uh, nodal agency for yeah, providing appropriate guidelines and capacity training program uh, in various level that is of course uh, is instrumental in the disaster management program and uh, you know that uh, 
as a summary we need to be think about uh, implementing disaster risk reduction program in our institutions like in schools we can uh, take an example from the other states you know neighboring states and other states like you know uh, rajasthan gujarat all these states are already started some there are initiatives and uh, of course each state needs to be uh, uh, plan accordingly how a disaster risk reduction program can be uh, talk out in uh, schools how a school safety club, club can be formed a school uh, stm or pta committee can be uh, helpful for in making disaster resilient how the nearby community nearby shopkeepers needs to be trained uh, for an effective disaster delivery mechanism in the school setup so i think i will stop here and definitely you know these disaster risk reduction needs to be incorporated and it should be planned in the each and every that do the planning of our life thank you thank you sir uh, thank you so much sir for this uh, presentation and uh, as you i would brief about some of the topics you have mentioned uh, the like the uh, whole action plan for drr speaking about the drr in, in indonesia and china how china is promoting the preparedness programs uh, for children you spoke about the various actors in uh, drr like local community and voluntary organizations ssgs and SS, hsgs and voluntary uh, responsibility of various stakeholders in drr and listing down the steps for uh, drr planning uh, thank you so much sir and uh, as uh, uh, i would request all the uh, participants to put some questions or whatever queries they have in uh, uh, the chat box so our uh, so i think there is a question for you uh in accordance uh, of community participatory action can you uh, can uh, community leaders involve governments to have public private partnership for effective drr and it can only managed by concerned community can i repeat should i repeat no 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 i, I heard no actually no it's uh, already we, we discussed about the it's a drr it's a, a combined action is uh, required and so of course that the community needs to be incorporated ideas and support mechanism it, it needs to be i think expand the primary level second level tertiary level support system no this uh, uh, private public partnership it's already of course in action that needs to be incorporated in the disaster discussion which i i think i felt yes and uh... yeah so yes uh thank you sir thank you so much sir there is uh, is there any other question so uh, i request all the participants they can put it in the chat box or we can end the session thank you so much sir uh, now i uh, as there are no other questions in the chat box so we can move ahead and with the vote of thanks with the final vote of thanks uh, and i would request and welcome dr uh, mr arun dravid sir for uh, final vote of thanks for this uh, uh, second day of training program okay thank you shipta um respected dignitaries and dear fellow participants it's my honor to express immense gratitude to all those who are present and participated in the second day of our online training program uh, first i extend my most gratitude to the moderator ms shipra das for her valuable time and uh, dr Sh uh, shubhash ar badra uh, who carried out the first session i sincerely thank him for his enlightening uh, us and then i would like to express my sincere gratitude to mr vivek ck who has handled the second technical session of this day thank you mr and dr vivek now i thank dr rajiv mm for ha handling the third session of this day for his presentation thank you dr rajiv finally i take this opportunity to thank the program team which is jointly constituted by nidm and crp and last i thank all the participants who are attended this online training program thank you thank you all